Hi, I'm Tim Crosby. What you're about to hear is a coaching seminar where Craig Mottram, Mike Hillart and Tim O'Shaughnessy discuss training methods for distance runners. We hope you enjoy it. All right, so obviously a, an exemplary runner, um, set some great records, world championship and Commonwealth Games medalist. Getting a world championship medal ain't easy, is it, Craig? Very tough. Very tough. So it's right up there at the Olympics, isn't it? And so is Steph. Depth, yes. Yeah, an Olympic medal would be nice too. Yeah, it would be nice. Hard. They're both very hard. As we can see, Craig's got a, a great, um, great background in the sport, um, and also now doing a bit of coaching as well. So well, quite a bit of coaching. So it's been a main gig. So yes. what's, your, what's your coaching background, or what are you doing? Right um, now? So been coaching for a few years, um, but primarily in the schools at the moment. Um, our company, my wife and I, set up a company a couple of years ago called Elite Wellbeing. My wife's done a PhD in athlete wellbeing, so she's a sports psych. Um, and we write and develop sport programs for independent schools in Melbourne. So we've got seven schools that we have contracts with, um, and we do everything from putting coaches in there um, to facilitate programs, as well as working in the physical education area, uh, wellbeing for staff, things like that. We've got 23 coaches now that are contractors that go in and run the programs on our behalf. Um, so I do that, but then also from an independent coaching point of view, have uh, about 20 athletes that are in, uh, in my group at the moment. Um, and tomorrow, we've got 16 kids that are running at the National Cross, um, across all the different schools and things that we work within. So, busy day. Yeah, fantastic. I'll just put you on the spot a bit too. What's your most memorable race win? Um, coaching or running? No, running. Uh, running. Your own personal um, one. Yeah. Well, there's probably two. The World Cup in 2006 was obviously a big one against Kenanisa Bakili, was really good off the back of the Commonwealth Games. Yeah. Um, but. From a personal satisfaction point of view, the, the 5K in Melbourne in 2012, mm -hmm. um, before I qualified for my fourth Olympics, I'd come away, I'd had multiple surgeries on Achilles and had some various challenges and things like that, and then to come back and qualify and run an A standard, which I probably didn't, not that I didn't deserve to do, but I was, I sort of, it was a bit out of the blue, and yeah. so that one in terms of my own satisfaction was probably up there. Yeah, and that would have been nicer in the home crowd as well. Very good. Yeah, at Lakeside. At Lakeside. Still Lakeside bitterly disappointed you. to not have Olympic Park. Yeah, it's a bone of contention. Yeah, yeah, we won't get into that. But um, yeah. yeah, so those two are probably very good. Obviously, World Champs was was good. Commonwealth Games was an experience like no other. Um, at the G MCG, yeah. walking from home in Richmond yeah. to Olympic Park and then busing to the G and then walking home and having mum make lasagna after running in front of 100,000 people was quite surreal, yeah. so but we'll get into all that as yeah. the night goes on. Right, next one on the panel, Michael Hillart. So, World Indoor 1500 metre champion. Mike, how long ago was that? 85. 85, yeah. So we're going back a bit of time here, and the, the beauty of tonight too, we've sort of, I wouldn't say three generations, but we're coming from different eras with each of our panellists, which I reckon is really important, because we're getting different sort of aspects and different views about uh, the timing of all of these things. Fourth on the Australian all-time list for the 1500 and mile, so yet again another miler, similar to Craig, um, and probably the standout in the, your day in Australia. You're virtually untouchable. Would that be? Oh, yeah, if I can say it, would you say it too? Yeah, I've never lost. Yeah, <laughs> in Australia that was, uh, yeah. but uh, internationally had a pretty good win ratio as well. Yeah. Also doing a bit of coaching now as well in the school systems. Yes been doing coaching overall since the early 90s, mm -hmm. uh, just fell into it by accident and then got into school coaching at Wesley College back in about 02 I think it was, 03, 02, and then left Melbourne to come up here to live and then got involved with the schools just on the side, uh, running programs as well and been doing it ever since and enjoying it and seeing uh, young kids sort of get a lot out of improving and you hope that they then take that on board in, in adult life so we're going to go in more into the individual stories of these guys because these individual stories are the basis of what i want to talk about tonight and some of the learnings we want to get out of tonight is is you know the backgrounds what they did how they executed their craft and i think it's important for any coach to understand what it takes and the different elements that it takes in order to be good at what you do whether you're teaching it you know um, coaching a child or coaching an adult, uh, the basis of what these three guys have done has some really good learnings for all of us. What's your best win ever, Mike? What do you reckon? Most memorable win? There were quite a few. A couple. I mean, the World Indoors obviously was a bit of a highlight. 
I think being a vet in Sydney, winning winning that race and setting a Australian record, yeah. and that was a, a qualifying time for the Olympics. So that was, um, I've actually got a few photos at home and I've got that photo of leading a vet into the straight. Yeah. And that's, uh, that was probably one and I had a, a really good race in Stockholm as well. Winning that at about 3.35, you know, it was a pretty tough field. And, you know, so there's a few, it's hard to pick any favourites. It's like picking your favourite trial, really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but beating Ovet must have been a pretty special feeling because Ovet was, you know, a huge oh, name in the sport. Looking at 84, he was running exceptionally well. And then, a, you know, a few weeks later or a month later, he was out here staying and training. And, and then we had the Nationals in, in Melbourne and got one up and won the game. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, about 3.36, and, and that was my qualifying to mm -hmm. make the games itself in 84. So, uh, I mean, I had a lot of great races with John Walker. Yeah. Uh, New Zealander. Yeah, yeah look, you know, Canada before the Olympics, so we had a race. Um, I won, beat him by like the head and the chest, mm -hmm. and he's, he and his coach Swear Black and Blue, they won it. And <laughs> got a photo of us crossing line, but the head on shot, not a side on shot. Yeah. Uh, and he and I had a lot of great races and a lot of close races too. So, um, yeah, just. A very good career. Yeah, look, it was a it was a healthy career. A couple of couple of races could have uh, been a little bit different. Um, you know, go left in a in a race as Canadian Tim know you make a decision and you've got second or tens of a second to make a decision and you go left instead of right and change the outcome of um, what happens. And of course, you can't go back and change it. So, so if I could though, the three probably three races I'd um, change the outcome and. Maybe we can talk about that a little bit later. For sure. Sounds interesting. All right, Tim O'Shaughnessy, number three, and look at that photo. Cool. What was that one from, Tim? <laughs> well, yeah, that's um, City of Surf, yeah. TNT. Yeah. So that was... Uh, There's a good story behind that. Can you tell us? Sorry, yeah. Tim. I'm yeah, well, for it. No, no, job, but the number in particular. Yeah, so the story behind this is that uh, it was so long ago that at that stage there was no elite start. <laughs> and... Uh, you can see by the number that uh, there was absolutely no um, priority given to, to anyone. And uh, we, I remember getting to the start line with a few other, you know, it was Chris Wardlaw and Rob DeCostello and a few other guys. And when we got there, the queue at the start was 400 metres. <laughs> and we go, God, what, guys, what, what are we gonna do here? So we actually all came to a pack. We said, righto, let's, there's a park pretty close to this. Let's, let's all start there together and then you know, get onto the course. And we decided we'd all wear an old T-shirt. <laughs> and when we got into the tunnel, T-shirt off and off we went. So as far as we were concerned, it was a, it was a pretty fair race. Um, so at the finish line, um, yeah, and, and, and I, I did win that race, but um, we were there talking about it. I remember the first people came across and they kept saying, God, did you see all those T-shirts in the tunnel as we went through? What was going on there? Anyway, there was a guy called Kent Rayner who was the uh, Australian cross-country champion at that time. And after about five minutes, he crossed the line in about 150 place. And he sees us all there, De Costello and uh, Wardlaw and myself and that. He goes, oh, that was crazy, wasn't it? God, you know, it's ridiculous, you know. Yeah, so how did you guys go? You know, he was first, he was second, he was third. He goes, what? <laughs> so the Tasmanian, which is a lesson to everyone, the Tasmanian, he got in the queue 400 metres down. And yeah, <laughs> yeah. So anyway, yeah, I don't know where you had that one up from. So. Yeah, no, it's amazing what you can find on the interweb now. Shows the age, the black and white, and obviously. Yeah, the, yeah. <laughs> the generation. Yeah. generation. So I said we are generation. And a bit of hair too. All right, Tim, you're also a world cross country representative, yeah. but also interestingly, a junior 1500 metre champion too yeah. in Australia. So a pretty diverse career, wasn't it? Yeah, so I probably didn't ever work out what distance I should run. I was, uh, I ran eights, fifteens, and uh, and cross country. So uh, yeah, should have run a good 5k. Didn't ever do it. Don't know why. Well, I actually, when I look back, I. I I think it, and certainly being a, you know, a good junior and I broke a, a Herb Elliott's 1500 metre record and didn't ever go on, this guy came along and started smashing us. Yeah. But actually, I, I think it, it, it made me look back at the training that I was doing and uh, I certainly see now there, there are elements of my training from junior into senior 
that, that and, and a progression from a junior into senior, which I think really helps me now in coaching and trying to get juniors to develop into, into senior runners. Um, Very pertinent thing you just said, because that's what we want to be talking about tonight. This is one of the key things that we see that so often, don't we, Tim, that that management through from the talented 15, 16 year old through to a international level or even a national level 20, 21, 22 year old. It's, it's a fraught with danger, isn't it? That word potential. I struggle with that word sometimes. Mm -hmm. yeah, potential, pathways. Yeah. Saying that uh, about potential is a fancy word for saying, for saying you ain't done nothing. <laughs> yes. I like that. Yes. Yeah. All right, we'll move on now <coughs> through, oh, sorry, what, what's your, apart from winning City of the Surf when you took your shirt off, what's, any other oh, thing for you? No, not, nothing like that. I feel pretty privileged to be with these, up with these guys. I didn't have any But the City of the Surf win is, is the City yeah. of the Surf. That's why right. I brought a notepad. I'm going to take some notes <laughs> and write down what these guys say. Just not to remind yourself <laughs> of the, yeah. Yeah. No, what they did. Um, no, look, oh, like, too long ago. Yeah. I, look, I enjoyed the cross-country races yeah. and... Um, you came through a good era of cross country though, didn't you? The guys you were racing week in, week out, either in Victoria or when you went to national level, you had yeah. to be bloody good to win one of those races. Yeah, so, look, know, there was no it was in that, in that era where people weren't going overseas, yeah. and so therefore the national cross had all our best runners still running the national cross. Yeah. Now it's, it's, um, yeah, it's just not possible. Yeah. So that race is not <coughs> the same as it was, but it used to be a real, and even the, the state cross country championships, you had you know, as, as a guys, De Costello, Bill Scott, Steve Austin, Wardlord, which I'm sure you know, there'll be people here who know those guys. That's that's turning up at yep. Fisherman's Bend or Bundura. Exactly, or week in, week out, wasn't it? Yes, yes, and I suppose um, the value of running cross country, yeah, I'm sure you'll touch on that at some stage as well. Yeah, and this is what we would really want to talk about, and we'll touch on, we'll, we'll use some case studies too, we'll talk about individuals and, and what they've done, including three gentlemen, and how you've used the, the different training elements. And it's not just a total focus on cross-country either, we'll look at other elements in your training, uh, and we'll talk about, you know, where your strengths and weaknesses were as well. First, we're going to look at the actual process, and that's really, we're looking at the development, specialisation, and then leading to performance. So, start with you, Mike, how old were you when you started? being a runner? Uh, first memories I was five or six, yeah. just doing sprint type races. I uh, won my first cross country mile when I was nine. I did judo, ran from the judo club, only won because the kid in front of me fell over in the mud about 20 metres from the finish and <laughs> kind of ran over the top of him to, to win it. So, yeah. but effectively I considered like when I got my coach when I was 13, 13. my first club coach. Uh, and had done a bit with school, cross country and track before that. But when I got my coach, things were a lot more structured. My dad would come home from work and tie me around the block, and, and I'd sort of be waiting for him to come home. Yeah, he'd tie me in. Um, but yeah, at 13, with the club coach. You were Brisbane was based at that time? Yes. Okay. Tim, when did you really kick off? When, when can you, what are your first memories of that? Uh, well, the first memory was uh, running, oh, I came to the country. I lived in Albury and uh, went to, uh, did the local sports there and went on to a place called Narendra to run what was equivalent to the districts, I suppose, in uh, uh, in, in Victoria, or, or sort of all, or really all across Australia. Then uh, then moved to Melbourne. And um, so I had a couple of reasonable races in Albury and then uh, went to, um, spent a year at Bourne High School where I didn't, um, I actually went to the house sports and mucked around with a few of my mates who didn't do any running, mm. and uh, when it went when when it went on to the next level, didn't do anything. So I didn't didn't run, and then I went to Xavier College, and uh, I still remember uh, it was a Sunday. Uh, it was about a month before the athletic season started. It was a knock on the door, <coughs> and um, it was Pat Clohessy, and he'd caught wind that this guy was not a bad runner, and he sought us out and. Um, Basically, yeah, he nurtured us all the way through yeah. those um, school years. But uh, <laughs> yeah, that just shows what he was like. He, he, he came, pick, used to come and pick us up, drive us up the hills, yeah. and um, yeah, really developed a group. So a great influence. So that that was that was how I got into. It. Otherwise, I don't, I'm not sure that I would have played footy and cricket and mucked around with my mates. Yeah. Craig, what were you, what were your motivations to get started? 
Because you had a bit of a difference. Yeah, sort of. I'm a little bit like Tim in yeah. that I, I started with both of these guys, actually. I started quite quite young, um, four or five and six years old. I used to, My dad used to go down, used to live at the end of the dirt road in Cranbourne, and dad used to run down and get the paper in the morning then, so I'd run with him and get um, and get the paper. And I, so I was always active, but I'm the middle of three boys. My younger brother, he's retired now, was a professional basketball player, played for Australia. Um, and He's six foot ten and 115 kilo now, and my old brother lives in London. And I used to always joke and say, just to get fed in my house was a, was a battle. <laughs> you had to be competitive to survive. So I grew up in that environment. Um, but I, I probably the motivation was the competitive nature at, at home. Um, I always knew I would be good, and I used to joke with Tim all the time, give me six months and I'd be the best in the world at anything. Um, but I knew I could run, um, and I started as I said, at a young age, but it wasn't until grade four that, um, that I did my first uh, state and national cross-country championships. And I actually went to the state championships of, I think it was Bundura or Brimbank Park, actually, I think it was then, qualified and then got put in this JLW athletic squad, which was uh, many, many, many years ago. Judy Pollock was the, the team coach and she wrote me a program for four weeks to get ready for national cross-country championships, 2K in Ballarat. And I submitted it as my um, PE project in grade four, saying it was my own work. <laughs> and my PE teacher was on to me straight away. So he made me do it every lunchtime. Right. And so he would drive me in an orange Kingswood down to the local oval and make me do this program to a tee. Yeah. And then I went and won the national under 10 cross country championships by whatever mum still had a perm. Yeah. And got it on the big VCR uh, cassette. So, I, you know, that, that was my first innings, I suppose, in, in running. And then, much like Tim, took a bit of time away. We change schools, change environments, that sort of stuff, did a bit of triathlon and then it was always competitive and then it wasn't until the end of year 12 in 98 that I got back into it um, more seriously, I, I suppose. Yeah, and the triathlon phase, was that justified? Because everyone still sees I'm crazy to come back and be a triathlete, you know. It's, well, it's... I, yeah. Um, I, I did triathlon from year 9, well actually probably year 10 because I went to Geelong Grammar mm -hmm. from year seven through to, or year eight rather, through to 12. So I did Timber Top, which takes you away for all of year nine. Yeah. Um, and then when I came back, I did triathlon for those couple of years and won the National Junior Triathlon Championships in 98, as well as the National 1500 mm. and cross country um, in that same year. Um, and tri I was going to be doing triathlon. And then I competed in the APS Sports in 98 uh, for Geelong Grammar and obviously had some ability on the track. Got some opportunities that were presented at the time. We had the Olympics in Sydney three spots available in triathlon, there were three spots in multiple events in track and field. Um, and I was working with a guy called Bruce Scriven at the time uh, from a running perspective. And um, initially it was a steeplechase because we saw that as an opportunity soft. to get into it. Yeah. Yes, soft. Not soft, but it, uh, well, more opportunity. Yes. Um, soft. Yep. Yeah, so <laughs> we did a bit of training for that and, and um, then I just picked it up pretty quickly in terms of the middle list and stuff. Went overseas, ran 13.26 in Battersea Park, qualified for the, the 5K in A standard and obviously went to the Olympics in 2000 Fantastic. in the 5K. The rest is history. Yeah. Um, but to touch on your triathlon stuff, I, we did look at it and after 2012, the Olympics in 2012, I came back and met with Triathlon Australia. Um, they're looking for a, ta a talent transfer, they always are, um, and did a deal with them for four years going through to Rio in 2016. Um, so I, I was transitioning, we were about to um, to announce it, and then I was riding out to King Lake, it's 36 degrees and a northerly, and I got halfway and I said, no, no way. <laughs> so, I so I turned around, yeah. wrote, got home, got on the phone to the CEO and said, look, it's not for me, sorry, and that was the end of it. Yeah. So I've never heard that story before. Yeah, no, that, so the deal was done, yeah. it was, um, was going to happen, and then I just didn't, my, I think athletes, when they get to that point, you, you, a lot of athletes will say, oh, my mind is willing, but my body isn't. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the other way. I think most athletes, when it comes to the end of their career, their body is always willing. It always will give more if your mind tells it. Yeah. And my, I just lost the desire to be at that, that one point, that level. Yeah. Well, it was happening in everything, yeah. you know, in, in my running and everything. Yeah. But I just, I knew the challenge of travelling, competing, being away from home. We just had a, our first child, all of those things, and I just didn't have the heart for it. Yeah. So I had to be honest and say, look, sorry. I'm it's a great story to hear that. Really good story, Mike. Were you, did you enjoy what you were doing in the earlier years and that development, or you were good at it, so that was the spur for you to keep going? Because this is one thing we often find with the juniors, isn't it? That 
the pressure comes because they're actually good at it and that just builds and builds and builds. But how much enjoyment did you have of the actual training and the participating in the racing? Uh, look, I had a, I've only thought about things in the last bunch of years uh, about those early years and how I sort of came about to realise that maybe I've got a future with this sport. Because when I was about 13, look, when I was 12, my, I went to a private school one out into house cross country. I remember the boys walking the course going, oh, he's gonna win, he's gonna win. And they looked at me because I was fairly new to the school. And, you know, I'm gonna be out the back door and I won the race by about 300 meters. <laughs> and, and annoyed a lot of um, people. A few, a few parents thought I'd taken a shortcut along the way, but I clearly didn't. Um, and when I was 12, 13, 14, I was, I was getting beaten. I was first, second, third, fourth, fifth. So I wasn't front runner all the time. But I was also, um, racing motocross and I did that every weekend and if I wasn't racing I was um, in the bush somewhere riding to my petrol tank ran out of fuel hands off the handlebars and doing this to you know straighten my fingers and I had a coach that were, when I was 13 I was running twice a week 14 three times a week sort of 15 you know so we progressed that way and when I was 15 I won my first Australian schoolboy championship and ran 358 and I look at it then because the boys I was racing, Marcus Clark and these other fellas and even the local boys here were running six, seven days a week. And I was running probably three days a week plus a race. And when I look back, I think uh, the motocross that I did, like in cross training, I rode my push bike to school, I'd ride flat out with whatever I did. Every afternoon I'd be there practicing wheelies. And so I think the cross training in those early years um, gave me a lot of strength, muscular wise, core strength, uh, and it helped balance out what the other boys were doing. Uh, and and yeah, so by the time I was 15, one of my first Australian schoolboys, um, I really, you know, didn't really sort of look at you know, coming third or fourth anymore. It was always a point in result. But I think that cross training for me in those early years laid a really good foundation of inner strength that I still feel it today, even though I'm carrying a couple of kilos. But um, uh, yeah, so when I look at cross training, I think there's a, an important balance. Yeah, it's an important one too. Look, uh, Tim, did you play much footy when you were at school? Yeah, so I swam uh, cricket footy. It's like country kid, you do. Yeah, you do. You do you, yeah, yeah. And um, uh, interesting that Mike touches on that. And I think you know, we're all coaches now, and I see our kids don't get that. Mm -hmm. They actually, the only really training they do is the formal training that, that they do when they turn up to their sessions. There's not the play, which I what I call play, riding down, riding a bike, swimming. And um, so yeah, I, I did that. I think that, that, that made a difference when I did start running. And How long did you keep football up for? Uh, I, up until year 10 and then into, I had a back injury which stopped me, stopped me playing football. And so I did cross country that year, and that's when the running elevated. So um, it was, yeah, probably fatal in a way. So uh, and a stress factor in the back, and uh, from a football or injury, yeah. the, it was really just okay. You can't play footy this year. Just do cross country, and then that's when um, when I got involved in it. But you're getting back whether I jump, but I did enjoy it too. I loved it, and uh, we had a great group. Pat Clovis, he certainly got that going, and it was it was fun. Mm. Yeah, a lot of a lot of band. So, so Clo was fairly instrumental, wasn't he, in building probably a team element to what you were doing he, as well. He was, he was. Because yeah. you know, how often do we hear this is an individual sport? Mm. You, know, you hear that term a lot, but when you see, and particularly through say comps like APS and the schools comps, the team element's really huge. Yeah. Even tomorrow, for the kids running for their states, that's team, mm. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. But look, he had a massive difference. He was one one person at one school. Mm. You know, the kids are there. If we had 50 Pat Cloessies at 50 schools all across Australia, yeah. we'd, we'd be all, you know, these right. guys, more of them. It comes from the coaching, no doubt, no doubt. Craig, um, how were you coached early on? What was the pathway through to coaching? It was probably through grammar. You mean for, as a young, yeah, athlete, young athlete myself? Athlete, yeah, yeah. Um, well, through forgery in the beginning in grade four yeah. um, but 
I think in, at school I just did what the school coaches told me to do. So Tom Ashton was was my coach at, okay. at Grammar. Geelong Grammar. Yep. Um, he's now retired and he's actually coming back around into the yeah, scene again. You see him down the town every yeah. Tuesday night. Um, but I, I I played soccer when I was at school through year 10, 11 and 12. Mm -hmm. um, played uh, first soccer in year 12. Didn't do cross country at school, just did APS. Yeah. Um, in year 11 I made the 4x8, that was the only thing I was good enough to qualify for. Um, and in year 12 I turned up to the first athletic meeting because Tom Ashton was also my PE teacher. Mm -hmm said you should come to our, so I did, and I was the only boy that turned up, so I was voted in as captain, and so then I had to be there for every session. John Graham doesn't have a strong culture of running. Um, it's primarily a boarding school, a lot of country kids, um, big in rowing and rugby. Um, so then I sort of took it upon myself to try to drive a little bit of interest um, in the middle distance stuff at the school, um, and it was literally um, Fartlek on Tuesday and then a 600, 30 second, 200 on a Thursday yeah. times two every week um, and Tom was the coach and another guy Lenny Carlton um, was the other coach, he taught me economics, um, I was no good at it, uh, So, but they were very enthusiastic um, and much to Tim's point, it, you, you build that relationship and you learn so much about sport when you're young and a sponge, you know, you take that in. If the coaches are uh, enthusiastic, they make it fun and an environment that you want to engage with, then that lasts, you take that with you throughout your career. And then I think... Going, does that shape you as a coach? Correct, yeah, forward. so then that yeah. transitions into the way you coach. And I, I got some really good advice a few years ago um, from Michael Klim, the ex-swimmer. Um, he said to me, the best swim coaches are the, are the uh, coaches that couldn't swim when they were kids, because they understand what it's like to be afraid of the water, they understand what it's like to not feel the catch and all these sort of, they can break it down. So every time now I, when I'm at school, um, we work with grade fives all the way through to year 12s. Sometimes some kids, they just can't run. They, they just don't get it. So I have to keep bringing myself, for me, it always came easy. So I could just run and my son's the same. He can just run, but for some, they can't. And I think it's really important from a coach's perspective to actually be able to remove yourself from the situation and actually go back and try to understand that some people just aren't as naturally gifted as, it, as others and then try to find a way to deliver that in, a, in a, an easy manner so that they can understand and then improve. And I think from, from a coaching perspective, that's it's like training. You've got to build the base first. You've got to understand the layer one first before you can go all the way up. Yeah, we often say that in coach education too, that uh, often if you've been in this game for 30, 40 years, as some of us have, You've got to remember what it was to take the first steps, the, the enthusiasm or the lack of knowledge, yep. uh, and also the little spurs that get people motivated. And I can remember distinctly, it was um, in the old days of magazines, and I'd be hanging for Australian Runner to come out once a month. I'd be going to the news agent because that's where I'd soak my information from. But we then become a bit immune to those sort of feelings over time, don't we? But it's, it's good to remember yourself. learn what you didn't like from the coaches that you've had throughout the, the journey as well. And then, you know, Tom was always really enthusiastic and he had a whistle and he'd blow it, you know, and I hated that. Um, and Lenny used to wear a bow tie, I didn't like that. Um, but the little things like that that you sort of pick up along the way, and they're the, you know, they're the kind of things that you, you learn as you go and sometimes you implement them just to get a reaction and, and think, and it's building those rela relationships is the key, I think. It is, yeah. in, Especially at school level building that relationship with the kids and their parents as well. Mm. Uh, they, they, they trust you and they believe in what, in what you say. And the training's very similar. Yeah. I mean, it's all the same shit. The training's really, the same. It's the same. <laughs> but it's just getting the kids yeah. to want to be involved in it. That's yeah. the key. Can I tell a bit of a story? Yeah, go for it. Uh, yeah. I nearly didn't do sport, actually, as, a, as athletics. Um, when I was 13, my dad, as I said earlier, been sort of timing around the block and he thought I should get a coach. So he took me down to Lane Park, which is Suncorp Stadium now, and this coach used to coach, I won't mention their names, but coach Olympic sprinters. And he said, he said to my father, get your son to do a lap around the Oval. And I don't think I'd covered 200 metres. And he, uh, he said, oh, the son's got no ability, he'll never amount to anything, sort of go home and take up a different sport. So we left and Dad's like, mm, okay. So I think it was about two months before we found my coach I ended up being with. but. It was interesting um, that someone can say something to you and that sort of leaves you at a crossroad. And you're only, only 13 and mm. you know, you've got your whole life ahead of you. Especially an Olympic level coach too, that would have, could have been devastating for a, a team. 
and yeah. he was a sprint, more of a sprint, sprint coach, coach yeah. so maybe he didn't yeah. recognise yeah. what little distance runners can do. Mm. <laughs> so that which that obviously sent you in the opposite direction. That meant you were going to prove him wrong. No, look, I look so long ago, but I just remember remember going home with my dad, and then the next few weeks him going, oh, like you know, I would do well at school. Mm. Um, I've done well at some other sort of races that I did, and my father didn't really see the same that this coach had seen. Mm. So dad, I think, persisted with uh, yeah. you know finding a club coach, and found, like I said, Clem, and yeah. and then we went from there. So it worked. So look, if we'd taken that bloke's advice on board, um, we wouldn't be sitting here now. We wouldn't be sitting here right now. Yeah. Um, Do you have the kind of To develop them, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. this is early mid seventies, and so I think I think the mindset of um, coaches and people in general back then would have been quite different. You know, now it's all about nurturing and guiding and supporting, no matter what level you are. But back then, I think um, it was probably a lot more cut and dry. And but we're actually seeing this. There's a lot of reports coming out of the US now with the collegiate football coaching and the dinosaurs, you know, because mainly because of deaths that they are literally killing kids out there through the outdated methods that they're using. Of that you're not tough unless you really push through this 36 degree day. So it is interesting that it still exists out there, but probably in athletics, I think we have seen a little bit of a generational change on that that front. And probably, you know, as Craig's saying, it's all about that connect, isn't it? It's that. Um, how do you relate to people? It's really important. And that, yeah. to me, as a coach, is the most important part. Rather, than we can be as technical as we like, but unless you connect to a human being, you're not going to be a good coach. You've got to understand what the triggers are with the with the athlete. And Tim's probably closer to talk about this, but I always liken it. There's two athletes at the moment that are very, very good in their respective fields. One's probably on the way out, but Gregson and Risley, two totally different personalities. Gregson, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's probably the kind of kid that you need to give him a rev up before the start and he responds well. And Risley, you need to give him a cuddle and tell him the sun's going to come up tomorrow and he responds well to that. But yet they're both very similar in terms of the way they perform. So I think it's it's understanding the different personality traits and then realising what yeah. what's required. And I'm not, not saying that that guy was, maybe that was the catalyst for you to go on and be, maybe you should be kissing his ass. I don't know, maybe that was the reason that you are who you are. He was but, very old at the time. Yeah, so old. there's always, you know, the different different ways to go about it. The makeup of, of the, particularly the younger generation is so different to then. Uh, the analogy I heard was uh, from David Parker who said that years ago <coughs> you'd say to yeah, he's probably really referring to footballers more than athletes, but it does um, you know it does carry over. But you you know you just tell a footballer run through a brick wall and he would. You know, now these days you, you tell a kid you know I want you to run through that brick wall and he'll go well. Um, What's on the other side? Yeah, what's in it for me? Yeah, yeah. Can I can I go around there or can I climb up here? Yeah. Whereas it's so you know it's um we 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 used to just do Mike probably didn't but I think people used to just yeah what the coach said you just go and do it now. So so yeah we have to as coaches uh, probably what Craig's referring to work out what to get the best out of the athletes and it's different ways with different uh, different people. Yeah, it's like which buttons do you press and which ones don't you press? You know, and you've got to understand that about each individual. We'll move a little bit now to specialisation, uh, going up the pyramid. I want each of you to rate out of 10 how good you were at track. So Craig, Adam, what would you score yourself? Well, I'll do it for him. He's, he'll score himself a 12. Yeah. So as no, a track that's runner, not correct. Yeah. As a, track runner, that's not you... correct because okay, as, a, as, a, as an athlete that always wanted to be better, I would, I'd have to say I was probably eight, because there's always room to improve, isn't there? Mike, as a track runner, out of 10. Yeah, probably, yeah, I'd say eight and a half, nine, yeah. I think. Um, like I said, there were a couple of races that did pear shape, so if I got those a lot more right, I probably would be nine and a half, so um, I got things more right than wrong. Um, cool. Tim, track runner. Oh, well, it, Way below these guys, but um, but for where you know, you've yeah, yeah, look, look, no, I do, I do think yeah. I'm comfortable that that uh, uh, I really couldn't have done much more to be any better. Mm. That's that that's and that's probably if you're looking at your athletes, you want them to finish 
when they finish and, and be able to say that, yeah, they they did everything they possibly can. To Be proud of the they DBs. Possibly can. Mm. Yeah. yeah, so I'll certainly come Well, right, I'll stick a few. Tim, what about road racing? How would you rank yourself out of 10 as a road racer? Um, yeah, well, look, as you saw before, it was from, I think I uh, represented Australia 12K and, and placed probably three times in 1500 on the track. So I was, I was a good all-rounder. A good all-rounder, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. A good ordinary all round. Yeah, we raced each other in the very early days. We raced each other, I think. And yeah, I, I remember you yeah. uh, racing. I believe you was about sixteen, and I was a lot older, <laughs> and, you, and you whacked us. Yeah. <laughs> what about my for you as a road racer? How would you rate that one or score it? Uh, look, I probably wasn't that good, only because focus of the training wasn't that way. Yeah, Went around twenty nine ten and for ten k. Victorian Championship. So look, I know with training I would have run, drew on 28 if I'd focused the training around 1338 uh, 13, for 5k. I'm confident um, that that should have been in the teens in, in those days. I know Norma coach uh, at one point midway through my career thought, no, it should be running 5k's. I'm going, forget it. Because um, uh, I just knew the training was, was different. And the psychology to the training was different, and I just got myself into a not a rut, like a, a pathway, where I was happy with that balance of what I had to do mentally, but also physically. And the five k just would have taken a, a couple of years to adjust, really, and I just felt I didn't have that time to to waste. Makes sense. Craig, road racing. It's a good question. I've I got... didn't pay that, sorry. Yeah, yeah come on, what, come give us a give us a score. I was quite hard to beat on the road actually mm. um, from from sort of a mile through to 10k so I'd say on par with the track yeah. I had a lot of success over 10k on the road um, had some good miles on the road some mm. 5k's um, so yeah I'd, I'd say on, on par to be honest all right let's go on to the next one for you cross country Where's this going? Um, I th yeah, I'm just interested. I reckon yeah. <laughs> I was pretty standard across the board. Eight out of ten. Um, I loved cross. Uh, loved world cross. Um, my first international team in Belfast in 1999 was world junior cross country. Um, it's a big event, isn't it? Huge. Yeah, yeah and it's changed. It's evolved since, yeah. Uh, yeah. or even since it's these guys would have run it, and then to my time to where it is now. It was more suitable to track athletes at the time because they had the 12 and the 4, yeah. so you could do the short course. Um, and I had some good results at that. I, I would say a couple of top twenties. Yeah, <coughs> yep. Um, I would say yeah, eight out of ten. Yep. So um, fairly consistent. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yep. Cool. Mike, cross country. Oh, looks Most people don't probably expect Mike to be a cross country no, fifteen hundred champion. Um, good eight hundred runner too. Really good eight hundred runner. Uh, in fact, I'll, I'll tell a little story. The first time I ever actually saw you was nineteen eighty six, and it was Seymour. And it was an 8k cross country, and it was the most horrible conditions I think I've ever run. People were literally sliding down hills, so it was that wet and muddy and horrible. And there's Mike Hillard turning up for track. He'd been at the World Cup the, week, you know, the year before, uh, and then suddenly I see you at a cross country. I was a bit surprised because I was fairly new to the game, and then you know our preeminent 1500 meter runner was doing an 8k cross country. Mm. Why? Um, look, I did cross country from the time I was 13. You know, I won when I was 16. I won a Queensland State Championship. At Limestone Park in Ipswich, and that's a pretty tough course. And then went to the Nationals and placed about fourth, I think, or fifth, something like that. So cross country in my teens was a big part of bread and butter for our preparation. And then in my adult life, I, I still did that. I did a lot of road races or fun runs. Um, so, so it was just a big part of our preparation. I was always a track runner, but when we we're doing our foundation work, it was just. Um, a way of getting a 3k, 5k, 10k um, solid run under your belt. Uh, How would you rate it? Well, look, look, because I didn't train specifically, my results were never geared to to get a result. So probably the same as a road, you know, six and a half and seven. If I'd been more focused specifically, I'm sure that would be a lot higher, like Craig's. 
Tim, cross country? Yeah. yeah. I probably felt comfortable, more comfortable than track and road running cross country. Uh, whether it was the just the different rhythm involved, the uh, hills spent a lot of years up at Fernie Creek, so um, there was a lot of gather. Most courses I I enjoyed the hills. What I gather tomorrow might not be the case from, <laughs> with the hills, but yeah, yeah I think that um, yeah, I felt felt more comfortable running cross country than, than on the track and road. Good, good. Because yeah, what I'm trying to get at with all of this is, yes, we've got you know some preeminent track runners here. Um, Tim probably more of the the all rounder. But did it stop them from doing all of the different elements of the training, or sorry, competition, and also potentially training to get there? And I, I think where I'm leading with some of that, I believe that that's been left behind to a certain degree. Um, correct me if you know all of you guys are now coaching, but do we see that maybe there's been a bit of a shift, particularly at the elite levels? There might be factors in that too, because I think Craig or Tim mentioned about going to Europe, and, and Mike, you certainly talked about that too. You, often your cross country might be in April, May of each given year because Europe beckoned in June, July, August. Would that be the case? Yeah, exactly. Look, we do yeah, definitely cross country and, and road racing in that April, May, early June. For, you know, of, of doing something within a week or two of, of leaving, going overseas. Um, because you know, I'd be away for a fair while, so I wasn't looking to peak the minute I was leaving. It was still when we went away to, to transition. So. But by the time we get to Craig's career, things have probably changed a bit there because you'd be spending probably more extensive periods overseas, um, and it was very rare, you know, because Craig's from Victoria like I am, and it's very you were very rarely sighted for a fair chunk of years at the domestic cross countries. You simply weren't around, were you? No. So you go, you generally race in Australia over the summer. That was mm. part of the requirement to be selected uh, to represent Australia, and then you'd head off to World Cross Country, which was March, April, yeah. and then you'd stay. I had a house in London. Um, and we'd stay there for six months of the year. We travelled to the US and then back to the UK um, to race. So the only real cross country you would have done um, would have been probably a trial race in Australia to get into the team and then the World Cross. Yes, but and we a couple did, of Gels Park relays. A couple of Gels Park relays. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, used to sneak those. In. Used to. Yeah. yeah. Look, then when it was on, when it was at the location that you were at, we would do it. I would do it. Um, I loved it. Um, there's multiple reasons why it mixes it up. So you talk about enthusiasm and uh, keeping people interested in things. It was different. Running the track all year does your head in. Um, and you can refer it back to periodisation and all those other various bits and pieces. You have to have time away from the track. It gets really hard. Um, but I did race cross country in Europe a couple of times, in Spain. Yep. Um, I used to run on the road quite a bit over in Europe and in America um, to mix it up. Um, never. As a junior, I did cross country all the time, but it's an interesting point, isn't it? As a senior, I didn't do it as much, mm. just purely probably because of the opportunity or lack, or lack thereof. Yeah. When going through the specialisation phase, though, what was the tilt or the shifting emphasis on the training elements? When we're looking at these road races and cross country races and track, do you, when did track sort of become more the, you know, the, the key? I, I'd say for Mike, it would have been, probably for most of his career, that would have been the case, but you because you were very good at cross country well it's opportunity yeah. as well there's there's not a season in cross country mm. there's not a um there's no diamond league or golden league mm. or golden spike whatever it was back then it, it's there's the european winter where the opportunity in cross country might be but that's our summer so the, the challenge of being in australia um is is just that balancing the seasons really and then uh, but in actual fact it's a benefit in many respects because we have summer all year round if we're here and then over there but it, it does miss the cross country element of it. There's a lot of things that are very favourable for being in Australia. Um, and having been in Australia now throughout the winter, since I've stopped running competitively, there's no reason you can't actually stay in Australia and, and train at a high level. It doesn't get cold enough to make you, you know, that, that be an issue, but then and travel. And I'm doing that with a couple of my athletes at the moment. We go over for three or four weeks, come back, and then go again. And Maddie's running tomorrow in cross country. So they're the things that will just but it's a whole it's into. a whole topic we can cover, isn't it? That whole thing about you know the, the necessity to travel and what you can actually do in Australia. Because I think sometimes those who stay in Australia and train, it, it's probably not the pizzazz of going overseas and all that, but it can be quite effective too, can it? Well, it can, but you it, look at a Montegetti, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's I suppose 
you're then looking at the full-time athletes versus mm. those that work um, part-time or full-time and the challenges associated with getting time away and those sort of things. It, it, athletics is a sport, cross-country is a sport that's not financially sustainable for many people. So they have to make decisions based around their future commercially and what they can, can and can't do or can and can't afford. And for me, I was very lucky. I had contracts that enabled me to be full-time so I could be in London and do whatever. But for the 99% of Australian athletes, in fact, I reckon there'd be half a dozen Tim that are probably earning enough to sustain a living in Australia. And you know, get Sally Pearson's, uh, maybe a couple of the NPC guys, but the majority of them have to work. Um, so it's very hard to be away for three, four, five months. And then I remember, I ran, when I ran um, 12.56, and I ran 12.56, I reckon I made 1,500 pound. Surprise money. Yeah, <laughs> it's it ain't much. So you, you know, like, but I was lucky. I had the ability. I had my contracts behind me. Yeah. But so that's the level you got to get at. Mm. And then when you get there, it still, it still doesn't make it for you. Yeah. So and then when you finish, the pathway mm. is not often there as well. So there, there's a anyway, digress. But no, that's fine. There's a lot I, of I think a lot to of your point, Tim. That, um, Craig, you, if there was a cross country on, I'd do it. You do it, and Absolutely. and I think with the train. You, you'd actually run really well in it. I think that's what you're getting Correct. at, Tim, mm. that yeah. the ability to run well, at, yeah. whether it's on the road, whether it's cross country, whether it's on the track, might not might not change that much. Well, Steve Ovet and um, Steve Cram um, and Coke, we used to run cross country all winter in the UK. Both 1,500 mile, 8, 15 mile specialists. Used to do it all year. And those aren't easy cross country no, places either. Yeah. Brutal. Yeah, they are brutal. brutal. Yep. Tim, you, you spent a lot of time in Victoria, you didn't travel, you know, because yet again it's a generational thing. Back, you know, you were coming through in the 70s and into the early 80s and the trips to Europe which weren't happening to the same degree, were they? So your, what would your season look like, you know, starting, say, in April? How would that shape up for you? What, what were your priorities? And yeah, well, as soon as the winter calendar came out, you'd, you'd know that's what you were doing and you'd, you'd do them. Um, and that wasn't a matter of um, if you're going to do them or if you're going to be fit, or if you were uh, um, going to peak for something later on. Yeah. And pretty much that was winter and summer. Mm. I think, Mike, you were a bit round a little bit on the uh, inter-club. There was no A-series meets or... Um, and because we were, we were amateur ath athletes, we would we pretty much... We competed a lot. But I wouldn't call it competition as far as easing of training. Turn up Saturday, you do the inter club, or you turn up and do the cross country that was on. It seemed to be that there were more cross countries on Tim than, mm. than uh, there are now. You'd have Possibly a couple of weeks. Yeah. Yeah. The seasons have changed a little yeah, bit. Yeah. Yes. But I, I just felt they were, they, they were, it was good training. That, that's, that's how well, I. Well, that, that's right. Well, you, as you're approaching each race, each race isn't an A race, is it? You know, the races would be, you'd have a pecking order yeah. of what you're looking yeah. at. And I think that's one thing that we're finding with a lot of the fun runners in particular, that they can't differentiate between what is something they've really got to go for and something that's just by the by that they're training through. Mike, we had an interesting conversation yesterday and you were telling me one year you raced how many times? Uh, probably close to 50, 45. Mm. I was sort of yeah, about yeah. 45, but that included hundreds, 100 relay, four by one relays, you know, cross country, fun runs. Um, so yeah, look, and John Walker and his guys would race often that much. Um, you know, obviously you've got heats and semis, and like in those days we'd join athletic championships. I'd run the 800 to have a heat of the eight, and then the um, quarter around the next that night, and then the next day, actually one day, I think I ran had the Victorian Luna Mile. Did that at midday on Friday. Had uh, had a 800 heat that night. I think I had a, a semi at like the next round after that, so three races that day. The next day I had the um, another semi for the 800, and then I had the um, 1500 meters, I think, heat. And then on the Sunday I had the final, so I raced about seven races, and I think I ran 146 to the eight, still at the end of all that. Um, but we just, we raced, look, we didn't see this racing a lot. I did the Inter Club a lot. That was my bread and butter. So you keep your training up during the week, though? Oh, no. definitely. Look, we wouldn't, we never ease up and, oh, we've got to, you know, peak for, yeah. we just ran through it. I might have, might have done a really hard 10 or 15 mile run the day before. Um, 
or done some sort of training session in the morning and then had an eight race or eight and a four, I always did like an eight and a four and a, like a 200 and maybe jump into a relay. So I just didn't go for one event, I did, I treated like training, high intensity training with you know, 20 minutes, half an hour, breaks in between. Uh, so that's why I raced, that's why the numbers sort of add up to quite a bit. Um, and it just wasn't 45 races of eights and 15s, it was a multitude of things. I personally believe athletes these days don't race enough. I, I believe, I wish they used in the club a lot more as a means to an end uh, to, and just treat it like training, but you know, it's a high intensive sort of training. Um, and you know, in my early days, I did, you know, as a, as a middle distance runner, I ran 21 eight for a 200, just because I did a lot of ones and twos and four by ones and you know, I ran 11 one, 11 two for a hundred. So I was very quick, you know, for a distance runner, uh, you know, 47 two or so for a 400. So, so all that in the club racing, Help me in preparation wise for an end result. Craig, your career's probably a little bit different from that because you would have been international a lot and not a lot of doing a lot of domestic things. Did you ever go to a, a low level meet and just do some stuff? I just for ran 11 1 for 100. Yeah, I know, it's quick, um, isn't it? <laughs> um, yeah, we used mm -hmm. to use the Milers clubs when they sort of kicked off a few years ago. Um, I ran 3K down at Doncaster many years ago. Yep. Um, not as much. On the track, probably more in cross country. Yeah. I used to run domestically for cross country for Deakin, which is my club. Um, but when I was 19, 20, 21, yes, I would do interclub quite a bit, 1500s and an 800, much to Mike's point, to do the, the two back to back races. I mean, it's it's hard to turn up to the track on a Thursday night, 5.30, and get out a really good you know, 1200 or 800, where if you turn up on a Saturday afternoon, there's a little bit of atmosphere there's a gun to get you started and the adrenaline happens and you can actually push yourself a little bit harder. So um, I used to do that with Bruce Scriven mm. more than uh, than any of the other coaches that I've, I've had, but um, I certainly agree that there's, there's more racing to be had. That's why we do it in the beginning. We kind of get away from the fact of what, what we loved about it um, and we start worrying too much about the results. And, and is that where you learn race craft as well? You do, yeah. I mean, different when you're younger. It's The gun goes and it's just hell for leather all the way, isn't it? There's not yeah. so much tactics involved. But you do. Um, when you get over to Europe, the racing is often you know the out, you don't know the outcome, but you know what's going to happen before the gun goes. So you know the pace. You know who's doing the pace. You know when the pace steps off, who's going to take it's it orchestrated. up. It's orchestrated. It's it's orchestrated to the point where you just you, <coughs> it takes the decision making out of it. Um, and then when you get to a major championship, it gets really complicated because you've got thirty blokes or fifteen rather that are you know over a couple of heats or semis that have never really practiced what to do if there's a slow pace and then you fall over and things like that, those mm. things happen. But it's, uh, I, I, I think, yes, you do. You learn your race craft through going in an unexpected situation. Well, I was gonna to say too, I used inter-club and state championships from time to time, where I'd, I'd practice different tactics and I'd put myself in very uncomfortable positions, either running last or getting purposely boxed in mm. um, and, and having to find a way to get out. So I just didn't run to you know, be disappointing in the lead. Uh, I mean, most of the time I did, but then I'd you know, talk to my coach Norm in Melbourne and he'd say, okay, well, you know, let's let's get yourself in an in a uncomfortable situation that, um, you know, you're going to have to fight to get out. And I was always pretty confident I'd take the race, I guess, anyway. But that in the club, state championship level, um, was just like Craig was saying, was it just another way of honing your craft? Well, it's, it's not necessarily easy to replicate that in training, is it? No, no, it not. can be done, but it is. Oh, you need about yeah. you need about five or six or seven blokes. About the same ability. Pretty yeah. solid. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the racing is where you can get that. You yeah. can talk about the doing more racing and everything else, but I think we've bred a, a culture now with social media and all that the race results are done like that, and people get too afraid of the outcome if they don't win, or if they, and then people talk about it, and then there's all that banter back and forth on. So I think it's a lot of our athletes shy away from the racing just purely because they don't want to be. Beaten until they're and then when they're ready they come out and they race and they deal with the outcome then yeah. but gone is the time where you can just turn up at interclub and cruise around without anyone knowing you were doing it because yeah, exactly. it, it's everyone's watching it yeah it's straight and on the Facebook yeah I used to do the BMCs in the UK quite a bit and I was 2012 I think I ran a 3k 
and my brother watched it in um, the Philippines on his mobile phone. It was live streamed on his mobile phone. He knew the result within, you know, which unfortunately happened. Yeah. It's it's unbelievable now. Yeah. So I think that that obviously has a big. That's right. And we we have to be dealing with changing times, don't we? Yeah. And particularly as coaches, it's um, it's one yeah. thing you've got to be very much on top of. And, and and also the different cultural stuff that this brings along. I mean, we've touched on a few topics there too. But you know, it's that uh, propulsion of personalities and uh, those sort of issues that we're really now dealing with. And and as coaches, how do we manage that stuff? And I'm sure all of you have got probably stories to tell if you are coaching, uh, particularly with younger athletes as well just putting the lid on some of those things or trying to manage behaviours that they're getting sucked into in many ways uh, because of that sort of push to push personality or to go for sponsorships or to be an influencer. Certainly changed the times from the old days. Mike, we didn't have that back in the 80s. And no, well, I sort of was in the early days of um, the brown paper bag and, yeah. you know, and getting contracts. I mean, I was yeah, in that sort of set the foundations really in Australia with those sorts of things and Deke was sort of there and Darren Clark and Monty Getty yeah. sort of came a little touch later but you know to, to think that I'm I mean in those days it was I'm going to take up the sport because I, I want to achieve and the monetary side of it was really not even a thought because in the late 70s early 80s I mean you couldn't see yourself as a professional sportsman and when you did you were sort of looked at as a doll budget mm. You know, you weren't probably on the doll, uh, and it it got you know got a bit easier as you got older to make a comment. I mean, I made my living out of the sport. Mm. Uh, maybe the same as Craig did later on, but then you know everything had evolved. Managers have yeah. evolved, and sponsorships have had um, become more apparent. Mm. Well, we've sort of covered a lot of on development specialisation and, and that tail in there we were talking a lot about performance what I want to talk about now though is getting out of that thing called the comfort zone I think it's personally as a coach I think this is a very important thing and we've dealt a little bit on cross country now Mike you weren't you know you've rode cross country down from track because track was your specialty mm -hmm. did it worry you going to Seymour running that 8k cross against uh, Montegetti and a few of the others, and maybe placing 10th, 12th, 15th, whatever. Was that a blow to your ego? No, but being competitive, you know, I, I wanted to be at the very pointy end of a race, but I knew Montegetti type people were having a different sort of uh, platform of training, and, and mine was quite different, so I understood. Um, that my result was just a means to an end, so it came tenth. You know, as long as the time was solid, that was the result. Obviously, I wanted to be better. Like you know, I've got friends who are competitive with everything, but if I go and play tennis, I can hit a ball. But if I don't win, I don't throw tantrums. Uh, I've got friends that get you know, a bit upset no matter what they're doing. So I know my limitations with certain things. So I know with cross country, my limitations were here. Uh, and I just worked with it. I didn't sort of get upset with myself because I expected to be here because that's where I w wasn't really. If it was track, that's a different story. Yeah. Tim, as a coach now, where do you see the value in this with the people you're looking after to the physiological and also the psychological value of pushing people away from what they always prefer? Because you might say have a 5K runner, they love doing 5K track. You try to get them into an 800 or you try to move them to a, a 12K cross country. How are you dealing with that? Uh, in the APS so, so, you know, system, it's, which um, probably about half the people I coach are in that system, and um, there's lots of uh, competitions, there's lots of different competitions. You get the track season, they do different events, they've got to do it for the team, they've got to do it um, you know, to get the points. That, that's, whereas you know, I'm not deliberately doing, getting them to go out of their comfort zone, I'm, but it, it, it just happens. Um, I think uh, of the others, uh, yeah, that's, 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 that's the biggest challenge, I think, is, is uh, not only to get them out of their comfort zone, just to believe what they can do. So, we, for instance, you, the National Cross here, you know, a uh, number of messages I had today, God, how's, look at the course, look at the course. Well, you've got to turn that around to, and say, well, yeah, you guys, you've trained for it. Run up at Fern and the hills up there. 
And I, as I guarantee everyone else will be in the other states. They'll, that's what they'll be saying tomorrow. So I suppose you've got to try and turn it around and make sure that um, it's that thing, belief. And uh, some have it, you know. You see, see as they walk to the start lines, those that naturally have it and those that haven't and the ones that naturally haven't got it, yeah, that's, that's where, where the challenge of being a coach comes in. And, and that's the great thing, I think, is, is that you can um, not only physically uh, help them, but also mentally help them. Well. Have you got any in particular tomorrow, and maybe Craig as well, you might, that you know that they're already freaking a little bit about this course? And if so, what is yeah, it that you I, can do? Yeah, as I said, it, uh, um, yeah, a number of men probably fell into the phone. You know. <laughs> Three mentioned the word brutal. <laughs> yeah. So what, what's your tactics now? What did, well, what I was saying, that um, uh, that they're prepared well for it. Mm. Yeah. So you reinforce the positive of what yeah. they've done. Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah. if I can say something, I think as an athlete you've got to learn to adapt. As a coach you've got to help that athlete to adapt. You know, sometimes people, if their flights are late, or if they, you know, if their flight is delayed, and you know they're upset, they've got to be, a, you know, they're expected to leave at a certain time. They get upset. Like I used to share internationally, a bed with fleas sometimes, and mm -hmm. eat bread rolls that are like bricks, and and you just have to work with it rather than fight it and say this is no good. You just you just got to work with um, a situation because then when you've got to race that next day, if you've let yourself emotionally go in a different direction. Emotionally, you're, you're going to struggle to, to compete very well. Was that something you had in it that, that was always with you, Mike, or, or, or did it something you worked on, or was it something that someone was able to assist you with? I'm trying to think it's a long time ago. Yeah. Predominantly, I, I think that came from me. You had it? I think so, yeah. I, I, um, I think I was always able to adapt to if things weren't going right, well, I just work with it. Like when you know training, I tell people like when you're training into the wind. I used to hate the wind, but mm. you know you work with it. You don't fight it. The minute you start fighting the wind and you're, you're struggling, you're strained, you lose. You know you just tighten up. It doesn't become the same. And I use and that's an analogy for uh, just being adaptable. Mm. You know tactically. Uh, you know you talk to the coach about certain tactics, and all of a sudden it pours down so hard with rain or someone goes out so quick that you hadn't expected, you know, you've got to learn to adapt and make decisions that will give you still a really good outcome. And you, know, you can't be precious. You've, you've, that's something I've found worked for me very well. Craig, I reckon you would have some great stories about this too before your travels. You would have seen yeah. some weird and wonderful things. I've seen many time. good and weird yeah. and strange things. Um, but uh, the, the word belief and confidence and all that, it comes up all the time with athletes. Um, and the majority, is of, as I've mentioned already, you train very similar way. So there's nothing, there's no rocket science really in the middle distance, long distance training that we do now, um, unless you're Galen Rupp. Um, that was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Just seeing who's awake. In this yeah. um, but I mean, I, I use little tactics that I've picked up along the way from the various coaches that I've worked with and um, giving athletes belief before they get to the, the race is really important. Giving them, making sure they're confident is really important. Um, and I've fielded questions the same as Tim has today from athletes that have been over the course. I actually encourage my kids not to go mm. to the course, A, because they've got to get off the plane from Melbourne and then drive out. It's, 40, you know, it's a big day, yeah. but they don't need to see it. They can run over it tomorrow. Yeah. They can warm up over it, then they're not worrying about it um, overnight. But also training on, on Tuesday and Thursdays, I, I give them repetitions at a slower pace than I know they can run. And then they run it and they go, run to the pace and they get, build their confidence up and make them feel good about themselves that way, um, which is important. And that I, that happened to me actually in, before I ran the mile record in Oslo in 05, um, I fell over in Bushy Park about a week before the race and went over to Ireland to see a guy called Jared Hartman, who's a physio. Um, and he told me I couldn't run for a few days, I had a bruised foot. Um, so a couple of days before the Oslo meet, I went to the track um, at Limerick and it, I was just doing four 200s, and as I was warming up to do my four 200s, it's the first one I've had in a few days, this guy just randomly jumped in with me in the warm-up and was talking to me and goes, oh, you're, you're Craig Motlin, you know, you're a legend, blah, 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 making me feel really good about myself. Um, and he said, oh, do you mind if I jump in for a couple of the 200s? And I said, yeah, no problem. So he did, 
and I was rolling 29, 30 seconds, nothing quick, and he was sort of drifting off the back, and then he was saying how good I looked and how smooth I was, and how, um, you know, how I was gonna smash this mile in a couple of days. Um, and then I went off and did my warm down, and halfway through my warm down, I turned over and Jared Hartman was giving him some money as he <laughs> walked in the car. So he paid him to come down and actually yeah. make me feel, and it worked. Yeah. I was up and about, and I felt really good about myself, and, I, and it goes back, you know, confidence, belief, mm -hmm. um, some call it, it's not arrogance, it's just mm. the inner belief that you have. Um, and then I went and ran 348 for a mile. And not because of that, you know, yeah. not because of that, I've done a lot of work, but had I not had that, I may well have gone and rolled my 30s and thought, oh, I don't feel very good, and then it just takes you the other way. It just, it's a, there's a turning point. Um, and a lot of it's pretty things. smart, isn't it, to, to just find those little things in the little He was very things. clever like that. Yeah. And, I, and back to the point of coaches when you're at school and things like you pick things up as you yeah. go, and. Yeah. Um, we hope, as coaches, that the kids that, well, I hope anyway, that the kids we work with now take some lessons from what mm. you've been able to teach them and carry them through. Can I tell a sort of similar story? Um, in 85, when I broke two Australian records in Europe that year, and, uh, in a race I ran my fastest 1,500 metres, and we were in Berlin at Istar. This is a psychology story. And Berlin's, you know, the, where they had their 36 Olympics, fabulous stadium. You know, 60, 70,000 people. It's probably the second biggest meet in Europe to Zurich, I'd suggest. At that time, it was at least. And, uh, you know, we were warming up, and I just wasn't in the right frame of mind. You know, all the best athletes were there. Uh, Awida was there looking to break the world record for the 1500. And I remember I did half my warm up um, on the track. I was just standing there doing nothing, watching all my competitors do their drills, their run throughs. And I was going, just can't be bothered being here. Anyway, the gun goes, I drop to the back, probably up to 600 metres, I'm just trailing along. The pace is like 150, 180 of a metre pace or quicker. I'm going, actually, that's not too bad, maybe I should have a go. And this is what I'm thinking in the race at, at about 600. So my, my next 400, someone timed it roughly, it was around 55 seconds, moved through the field, and ran 3.33 and came fourth. The weirdo was out in front, 3.29. And then I think uh, another bloke was, Sydney Marie was uh, 3.32. And then Delise was like this far. So between second and third was from here to 10. So I was sort of, you know, thinking if I'd just gone in with the right frame of mind, what, um, you know, how much quicker it would have been. And yet I ran in Zurich a few days later, ran 3.52, feeling fantastic. First few steps just felt like rubbish, and still ran 3:52, but you know it was not a great result for what I wanted at that time. So I'm sure Craig can relate to a couple of those, and Tim, I'm sure. There's always a point, isn't there, in a in a competition where you've got to make a decision: you're either in wholeheartedly or you're not. And it, it's that. Well, my wife talks about it all the time: fear of failure. So the, the decision is based on whether you're prepared to have a red hot go and decide and find out whether you're good enough, or I don't want to find out that I'm not good enough, so I'm going to not give everything, and then I can walk away going, well, I know I didn't give it everything. Next time, I I can, and that's the biggest challenge is actually getting them in kids in or athletes in the space to be unafraid of the outcome, irrespective of you know of what that might Do you be. Think that can be a habit forming thing, yeah, exactly. a little bit like the DNF. Syndrome yeah. that can start to happen too. Yep. And and you can pick is, it. Yeah, yeah, you can see it happening. You can yeah. see it happening. Yeah. Um, saw it on the Gold Coast Australian track and field yeah. a lot. Um, I think it happens more in the middle distance events. Um, it's funny. It's probably eight, fifteen, five, and ten that happens. Marathon, not so much. Yeah. And the shorter ones, obviously, not so much. You don't have that time. But it's you know, there's. I think that the, the way. The question comes during the competition, but the decision is made before. If that makes sense. So it's 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 the the space that you can get the particular person in before the start, then enables them to make the correct decision once they're out. So you don't have to go to Ireland to get that confidence. By the way, there's a track in Melbourne, Stradbroke Park. I don't know. Do you know Stradbroke Park? I know so we're not we turned up to train Stradbroke Park the first time ever. Grass track in queue, and uh, there were nine lanes there. And the person who's showing me, um, I said, oh, what, so that's, we go in that, the inside line, no, 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 the 400 metre is in lane two. And I said, 
Yeah. Hang on. So there's nine lanes, eight lanes out from the, you know, from the, from the inside. Well, what's that inside lane for? That's the confidence lane. <laughs> <laughs> <It's just laughs> over there. Send them around that if you want to get in the confidence. <laughs> So yeah, it's well, it's they're, 380 they're, metres. Yeah, around. they're good little tricks, aren't they? They're, yeah, yeah. they're, the, they're, they're very, yeah. very important. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. headspace you go, you get yeah. your, your people into or you into. Yeah. Is, um, and I think as coaches as well, you, you have, you don't want to hesitate when that question is asked of you as well as a coach on mm. competition day or in the days preceding. You, you need to have some strategies in place to counter what, what might come. Yeah. Um, so that you're not, oh, you know, I don't know about, you know, like that, that doesn't... Yeah, it's confidence, confidence as a coach is actually something we don't talk about much, is it? Yeah. And I think it's very important that you've got to, you've got to say what you say and then back it up yeah. and have the confidence to back that up, don't you? Yep. Um, and how do we learn that? <laughs> yeah, I get, you get asked all the time, are you yeah. born with that or is that yeah. something you learn? Oh, yeah, it's probably a bit of both. And it's probably experience as well. Do you? Yeah. yeah, you you see over your career as a coach, you will see so many different things, and you know, you pick things up. Well, yeah, I see this going to yeah. coaches. Yeah. Has anyone had an experience like that, or you know, where is it where we're learning these tricks and from? Where where do you guys get your knowledge from? Is it experience? Is it mentors? Anyone got a good example of this one? I, I sort of believe that it's fourteen. Like a, just started training. Um, he's still not training particularly seriously, but he's coming out with me once a week. At the moment, he does a lot of other sports, which I'm interested right. in the, you know, the cross training. Yeah. Um, and he hasn't run, uh, hadn't run more than six k's um, continuously, apart from in training with fartlek and things like that. And last weekend, he wanted to have a go at the um, 10k at the Sunshine Coast Marathon. And I was a bit in two minds because I wasn't, I didn't want him to hurt himself, but I also wanted him to, I just thought it'd be interesting to see how he went. So anyway, he went into it and I sort of encouraged him and I sort of had in my head that he should be able to run about 37 and a half minutes for the 10K, even though I knew he hadn't been over the distance. And so I didn't, I said, I said to him, you know, I think you can, you know, you should be, you know, well under 40. You know, he ran 38 and a half. But the thing was, he was really keen. He was really keen. He had in his head that he was like, I'm going to, and he, and there's no chance he was going to win it. But, you know, he felt like he could. And he went into it feeling like he could. And I think that. Would have done pretty well in his age group, though, mm -hmm. I reckon. Yeah, well, he actually, he was actually third in his age group. Um, another boy from our group ran 35, 12, and he, he was. And how did you sort of get the gauge on what you thought he was capable of when he hadn't been near that distance? I was this is at, he's, I've, I got the gauge from because he he runs comfortably, just seems to run comfortably at about three thirty three forty pace. Yeah. He's only just done a few. He's had he's only been on the track um, a little bit, and he's he ran three. Um, 4.40 for the 15 right. last week and he was ran 10.29 for the 3,000. Yep. Um, so he's just sort of getting started. Yeah. And um, so, but just knowing what he does, like over the cross country, he's, he's sort of running consistently around 3.30, 3.40 pace. So just based on where I knew he was comfortable, yeah. I was hopeful that he yeah. could Extract maintain right it. Yeah. But looking at the splits, he, um, he started off around 3.30 pace and then a bit slower and then the last couple of k's he blew out to four yeah. minutes yeah. and so that's where and that's indicative of training yeah, yeah that's indicative yeah. of training yeah. so i sort of yeah. knew that that could happen but because he'd never been over the distance i thought maybe he'll maybe he'll just pull it off because yeah. he's got he's got a really he's got that belief mm. and that when you're saying that i thought that's you know you You've do got, see that yeah. you got to bottle that up don't you you've yeah. got to really you know and work on that too i think you don't sort of suppress it at all and, and you know, one of the, your responses might have been, "No, nah, you're not good enough to. Win. You're not ready to do 10k. We're going to just squash that for a while." But you've actually in, in, enabled him to do that. Mm -hmm. and luckily, hopefully, well, uh, you know, luckily it worked. He yeah. didn't turn up to training. Yeah. But yes, that's where you got to believe in yourself too, and your own yeah, gut right. feel. Yeah, that's, I guess is this true. right or is this wrong? And for some, maybe it is a wrong choice too. Yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah, that's it. I suppose my gut yeah. feeling for him is that this is the thing to do. Be okay. yeah.
And these are the things, isn't it, that we accumulate over time as coaches, those little anecdotes and stories, and you relate those back. Uh, but bearing in mind that all of them are going to be individuals and you won't have the same result with each one. I think it's important not to cut corners, you know, as, a, as an athlete. And if the coach says, you know, hour run and I'll be out there by myself, I'll do 55 minutes, no one will know. Mm. Or, you know, I remember Christmas Day doing 10 400s and I could have done nothing and no one would know. And one session won't make a difference to my life, really, but you know, couldn't do that. You, know, you just have to be honest with yourself. and. You know, that's what your coach is giving you and you're on your own training or with your, with your training mates. Um, I think you've got to fulfill it because if you take shortcuts in training, you'll then psychologically get a little bit weaker and, and then in racing you'll look for shortcuts and look for excuses, especially when things go pear-shaped. Um, Perhaps even in, in life in general too. Look, yeah, I, I think it crosses over completely. I, I know that I've trained exceptionally hard and you know, on those days, New Year's Day, Christmas Day, no one around at all, and you're just doing this sort of session that you think it's got to be somewhere else, but you've, you've got to do it. But I think just touching on earlier, one of my strengths was, was uh, being able to put up with a lot of pain. I had a very high threshold of, of what I could do. I mean, one of my hardest sessions I ever did, I did with Peter Burke actually in Poland in 82. We ran four 400s, we had a 10 and 11 minute break, and all the 400s were in 49 seconds. And I remember starting the third one, just uh, starting, starting the fourth one, and a couple of minutes to go before we had to start, just staggering, like thinking I couldn't run 30 metres. And, uh, you know, just mentally my head exploding from the lactic acid building up and everything, and, uh, you know, we still got the sub 50 second run out. So, so being able to put up with pain as an athlete and not looking for shortcuts to, to soften the blow, I think makes you tougher when the toughness is needed in competition. Uh, so, you know, I don't know how you coach your athletes, but I think, uh, you know, finish the job. I always say control the session, don't let the session control you. But that's often through pace judgment. And if you've got, say, 10 400s and they're in 60 to a minute recovery and the athlete goes out in 55, for the first one, they've destroyed the session. So teaching athletes pace judgment from work go, I think is critical because then they can then do everything properly, then they'll race properly, they'll go out with, um, with um, an expectation of not blowing up and uh, you know, destroying the race. What, what I find teaching them pace judgment can be difficult at times. Do you have any tips? Yeah, look, I've, in more recent years, I've started using a whistle and I'll say, you know, say to the girls, okay, we're running 300 in 60 seconds fragments. So, Okay, well, I'll stand sort of back a bit. Steeplechase is my halfway guide, give or take. I'll blow the whistle at 30. So when you get to that steeplechase, that, you know, you should hear the whistle. If you're way past it, you've got time to adjust. If you're way behind it, you've got time to adjust for the last 150. So, so I blow the whistle a lot. And then when I realise at the end of, towards the end of the session that they've got more capacity, I say, okay, I'm blowing, blowing the whistle at 27 seconds, or 28. So they know when they get to that. So I say, remember that feeling. So when we yeah. come back to doing it next time, just don't run and be mindless about what you're doing. Remember, remember this emotion, remember this feeling, you know, remember the condition that you did it in. So it's all about repeatability. Yeah, thank you. How would you like the whistle session? Well, that driving, as long as he doesn't wear a bow tie, I suppose, he's right. <laughs> well, the word I take out of that is, is feeling. Um, if I look around the room here, probably every single person's got a garment on. Um, that, that's a big issue with pace judgment. It is, um, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I, I did a session with a triathlon group, actually, not last school holidays. And I had all their coaches, there's maybe this many coaches in the room. Um, and I gave, and before I, I, I gave them a session. Um, and they were all a bit anxious about what they were about to embark on. And I said, but I'm going to do the hardest thing the hardest part of this session, uh, we're going to do it to start. Um, it'll be a shock to all of you. Uh, it's going to be built it up. You know, driver ties are very good. I hang it beautifully. Um, and I said, you can take your gun, watch yourself, and you're going to put them in the bucket. And they did not want to do it at all. And the coaches said to me, well, where are we going to get the data from? <laughs> <laughs> and, what? and 
and I said, well, what, if it's not on Strava, it didn't happen. He said, these kids, they don't know how to, to run on field. They get off the bike and they look at their watch and they, I can run 5K in 16 minutes, so I should be running you know, 310s or whatever it might be. But off the bike, it's different. You know, it, it might be uphill the course tomorrow, just because you can run a 5K tempo and, and around the town in 15 minutes, you might be able to do it. You've got to learn what it feels like. So that, that you know. It is important too, and probably feelings. Tim, yeah, you would have been of the era where you used the Nilex clock to, to do the tan track. Um, but I reckon if Chloe had said to you, go and run a 62 second lap, you would run a 62 second lap, wouldn't you? Are we finding that across the room too, that pace judgment, particularly for juniors, is going out the door? They don't. I find it too with recreational runners, I coach too, I had one yesterday, and I said to her, just be more relaxed on the first one, and we know it's going to get harder, just totally balls it up. And you just see the splits go, you know, they just can't get it. And I actually like the idea of the whistle because it gives them that little bit of a measure out there. But is anyone else finding that too? The, the juniors, you tell them to run an X lap. Yeah. Yeah, I find it really interesting looking at the group that, that we train and then looking at the group that my son's in. So we have quite a uh, junior development group up mm. here probably in the high school, but you have a lot of younger siblings who come along. So they split it in half. And what's really interesting is one or two kids in there with a watch on or without a watch on, they will run exact same, same time, time every single split they're just amazing and the consistency is incredible and other kids are just so dependent on their watch and even mm. the little little ones they just i don't know if it's the youth or the toilet a lot of them are measuring their distance though aren't they yeah, yeah. yeah. rather than timing themselves i think they're Correct. still up around you know yeah. five the, how far they run in the session the, and the uploads and all those sorts. one of the funny things i've ever seen in my squad was someone stopping mid-rep because they lost signal <laughs> Go figure. But, no. then, but the other thing that comes yeah. up is too, yeah. I reckon a lot of them lose their balance in running too. They're too busy to make sure they're on, you know, it might be only two or three strides, but they're actually looking at their watch. Yeah. Well, it's very interesting also. Our son trains with Ian Hatfield in So what's then the true indicator to effort? So I said that's probably comes down to feeling more. Um, yeah. so I'm just there's it's probably a personality thing to it. Um, like I'm thinking of me, I'm starting to be running, but I bought a watch. I can't wear a Garmin, but I've never looked at it in a race ever. Probably I find it too hard. But <laughs> and I said it's funny that there's a few kids, as you say, that I've seen kids at the age of six that want to know their time yeah. when you just get them to run around the playground. And then there's other. And then maybe there's a personality thing to it as well, that's all. They said some people are very data driven. I run with a guy that's an engineer and yeah. he's amazing with just all of everything he knows. And there's another guy that puts paint marks on the bike track. Yeah. Back to Tim's original point about the old footy players. You tell them to do this, they run through the wall. We respect it. Now they want to know why, when, how far, what's on the other side. Kids want, they want information. And it's... Um, these things they give it, but the one that asks, one thing that I bet bet you, if you have a look at your kids, what what they don't have on their home screen of their watch is probably the most important thing. What do you reckon that is? All of them do it. Have the functionality to do it. Tim, you would know the answer. Heart rate. Heart rate. Yeah. Yeah. That's the only true indicator of what's going on. Yeah. 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 Sometimes these can be quite wrong. Well, you know, well they yeah, can be, but if you set it up right, yeah. yeah then, then, but yeah. often they have them on the wrist as well. Mm. But that's actually what, what your body's doing. So yeah. moving over the ground is a third party. It's, yeah. a, it's not relevant to what's actually happening. It's, it's, it's a whole other topic we can get into. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, the, the sorry. Thing and, and, no, 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 say 30. Yeah, 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 yeah. but it's, um, you know, no, I'd love to actually do some more stuff on that because I reckon it's really I remember important. Craig, he, yeah. you Religious. used to use heart rate, but then yeah. you actually knew your body well enough. You didn't even need... I could tell you what it you was. You could tell it what yeah. it was without looking at the watch. So, but... Um, That's yeah. going to be in tune with your body, isn't it? And then the pacing yeah. is yeah. then. So your we'll tempos come off that. to thresholds to anaerobic, all of that sort of stuff is yeah. learning. You can feel it, yeah. to, even to the point where you'd be running along. And I used to have a guy on the bike with me all the time, Gary, and he would set the pace and I would follow. Um, and I would bark at him all the time, no, too quick, too quick. And uh, but I wouldn't have no no data, nothing. I'll just be feeling. It. Yeah. 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 Just I like, think that yeah. it's helpful to at a young age to teach them how to pace is to put the onus on them to learn it. So if you give them a time for a set rep, they have to learn how to 
get around the track in that time themselves. So you see a lot of coaches who are in control of the whole session too much at a young age, where it's great to put the onus back on the, on the child to work it out for themselves, to work out the pacing themselves and just um, uh, facilitate that so they do learn the paces themselves. You're, you're not the one out there controlling it. You might know what the pace is, but they don't know what they've run. Mm. Mm. And it's harder in a, in a group setting when, mm. when you're doing a track session and there's a big group all yeah. running at the same time. You can know your pace really well when you're running by yourself, but when you've got others all around you, um, the effort sometimes can feel the same and you look down and it's much quicker. Well, they've carried you, haven't they? Yeah, so yeah, yeah they can you along. Yeah, yeah. The peloton effect. But um, just one other thing, like with with my athletes, the first thing I do normally we, we take off any form of gadgets, and sometimes even glasses, something kind of thick sunglasses, so the depth perception they lose, especially if you're running on trails. So disconnect from everything and get in tune with the body, and with effort levels it comes down to breathing for me. So you can control your heart rate with your breathing. So if you're holding your breath, your heart rate slows down. If you start breathing quickly, your heart rate goes up. So there's a, there's a correlation between that. So we, we, we sort of um, train to get used to effort levels with, uh, is, is comes from, from the breathing, basically. So you know, you've got your quarter effort, your three, your half, and then three quarter effort. And, um, and throughout a race, um, you can start to control more through your actual breathing, your breathing and rhythm. We've rolled through 90 minutes really quickly, which I sort of expected we would. Um, is there any questions that, you know, burning questions from the floor of any of our three gentlemen here? Anyone want to get anything else out before we discuss? Yeah, I just want to um, find out, you know, from all you guys, what sort of gym work would you have done back in, in your peak training area? Good question. Strength and conditioning is such a big term, isn't it, for yeah, us now? Yeah, well, there was, there was gym involved. Yeah, we'll, we'll start with, with Tim, you know, going back to... Uh, yeah, I used to swim across the Murray River. Yeah. I would, um, uh, I reckon I got a lot of core from just playing. Yeah, I, I didn't know it at the time. So so I would ride the bike to the Oval, we would um, so do none. mates. So yeah. none is that. No, well basically no, what, no, no, no formal. Yeah, no formal, formal. What, what we're but talking about. But I think that uh, uh, I actually did get a lot of informal core work. Yeah, well, this is what I call the, the fitness of the baby boomer generation, uh, which was a very active generation. Um, you know, on the weekends, Tim, you'd probably be out on the bike in the bush most of the weekend just doing stuff. Yeah, I think... And that was activity the, stuff. The, um, and, and, and probably as coaches now, we have to take that into account. So they do need formal yep. strength or yep. gym work that, that's Mike not coming through you play. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, look, I, I did, um, when I moved to Melbourne when I was 21, uh, my mum was born, uh, thought I should do some gym work, so I ended up training with uh, a bloke that worked with a lot of tennis players in Melbourne. Um, and I, in my build-up phase predominantly, could do twice a week. Um, I'd run there, sort of run 5K, sort of 8K there and back do an hour of gym work which would, would be bench press, sit ups, half squats, bench press, um, lat pulls, uh, jumping up on a step with weights, you know, sort of being explosive. Uh, so I did a fair bit of that and I probably put on a little bit of size so I was probably, I was only 70 kilo but I was probably physically bigger from my height than most people I ran against. Um, most were about 65 ringing wet. I was about 68, probably 70. But yeah, gym played a, a bigger part in my life and my later part of my career, if you call 21 onwards. Mm. Part. Craig, you would have had extensive. Yeah, I did a bit more core focus stuff, um, circuit work. I'd play around with the, the weights a little bit, mm -hmm. but I used to always- Under direction, were you guiding? Um, yeah, well, VIS. Yeah, VIS. Yep. So um, when a new strength and conditioning person comes in or that sort yeah. of all took off, obviously they've got to sustain their what, they, what they're there for, so they implement these sort of things. But I never felt good off doing it. So I always used to live by, if I do something today that's gonna impact on me tomorrow negatively, I probably shouldn't be doing it. Um, and every time I lifted weights, I just didn't feel as smooth. Um, I felt that I got enough strength from rolling hills, hill repetitions, 
Bill reps were probably the biggest reward for effort, I, th I thought, in terms of the training that I did. Was that drills on hills or just hear repeat? Re repetition, so anything from two minutes, three minutes, 60 seconds, 30 seconds, depends on the gradient, what you're trying to get ready for. Um, but structured lifting, no, it was all just circuit based, was it? But there's a lot of different science going on in this space, isn't there? And you know, talk to a lot of, yeah, you because know, uh, initially in the endurance world where we came from, we were told, oh, you would do lighter, lighter weights and higher reps. But that's all switched now because when you're going out and doing your tempo running and your your general even steady state running, you're doing the same thing. So the theory now is that you actually do do the higher weights, so long as you know how to do it. And I think that's one of the problems with with poor instruction can be a bad thing. Right? As Mike said, you <laughs> took it up really when, early when you were in your twenties. Yeah. So, I mean, what age? I was 21. Like, I think yeah. my coach in Brisbane here, um, we dabbled with it sort of when I was about 19 or 20 at home, yeah. and deadlifts and dumbbells and things, but we just, it was almost non existent really. And I mean, I would think, personally, my own view is with um, kids that are in their teens, uh, probably up to about the age of 18, I probably would discourage yeah. doing yeah. gym. I mean, maybe a circuit work or of sit-ups and push-ups and that kind of thing, like using body no weight. body weight, yeah. I think would be okay. But getting kids at sort of 14 and in the gym and bench press yeah. and do, I, I personally wouldn't, um, yeah, that's what I think as well. wouldn't kids go down that path. Yeah, and look, even what we did, you know, maybe, <laughs> look, we did it for windows of time. It wasn't like a 20, you know, a 52 week year uh, situation yeah. we did. So. Um, well, that's another important mm. factor too when you're looking at programming for a certain event, say it is tomorrow, your key gym or strength workouts would have probably been at least six, eight, maybe mm. ten weeks ago. Yeah. And then that changes as the running volume goes up. So getting that, marrying that is also important. So your peak of your strength won't be the peak of your mileage either or else yeah. you, you actually, we're seeing um, stress reactions and things like that now coming out of gym work as well as the pounding on the road. Mm. So you've got to be very careful with those elements too, that you're not overloading, not just on the road, but also what they're doing in the gym. Mm. Well, as Craig said, you know, like hill training, hill reps, I mean, it's, yeah. it's there's little substitute for that if it's done right and balanced right. And, and then even just general running, you should probably get a lot of strength. But sometimes you need just a, a push along in another area that you're lacking and just the actual running itself can't seem to fulfill. Mm. So you just got to find, you know, when that timing is right to maybe introduce something that's new, but not disruptive to risking injury or risking other parts of training. Like, you know, like what uh, Craig said, if, if we had a hard session, well, we dropped um, weights that morning. So the session itself could be functional. Um, so we were adaptable just because it was there. We just didn't do it. We, we made changes. And my coach often, if I wasn't running that well, um, okay, just stop halfway through the session, you know, uh, just go run around the town for a couple of times and finish off. We'll come back tomorrow yeah. and that's a new day. So sometimes coaches say, you've got the session. I mean, I had a my coach, he, my first coach, if my session wasn't great that night, I was back at six, six o'clock back at uni repeating it. And I look back and think, probably should have not kind of done that. So I, as a coach now, the things that I was taught with several coaches that I had, I sort of picked the eyes out of what really works for me. And on some things I sort of leave alone. Um, I think you know, as a coach you evolve and you, you, um, you structure yourself to the athlete's needs. Um, I think there is some value in the strength, um, particularly for our cross-training I would thought. The, um, for example, ACL returns are higher since in, in 12 to 17 year olds. 
because they're not doing any service. Yeah. 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 It's very bulk, bulky muscle, but they're not doing any service. And you could do plyometrics, but you know, zigzag. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it also helps in the stress, mm. stress reduction, which is a stress injury. Mm. Any other questions? Well, um, thanks, Craig. Thank you, Mike. Tim, thank you so much. Uh, hopefully you've all got some bits and pieces out of today. Fairly general conversation, as I alluded to at the start. You know, we just meandered and navigated around. But, uh, you know, I found it absolutely fascinating. You know, three great exponents of our sport in the country. Um, so I think you guys have been gifted to have them here in your presence. And thank you so much for coming along to make this worthwhile for us as well, because it can be hard to get people along, especially on a big weekend like this. We know it's a big weekend for the National Cross Country and for those of you who have got uh, runners running today and in the relays and things like that, good luck. Hope it all goes well and hopefully we'll cross paths again, if not tomorrow, somewhere else around uh, the trucks of Australia. So thank you so much. <coughs>